spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs and Beachside Roofing. Well, aloha, and thanks so much for tuning in on this Wednesday morning. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. We took Monday off for President's Day, but we find ourselves back here in the conversation, uh, shining a spotlight on the matters at Red Hill. Yeah, this is an ongoing issue, and you know the cover of the paper today talking about Maisie Hirono's stance on the issue. Uh, we want to talk to the chief engineer at the Board of Water Supply, Ernie Lau, who has been a consistent, clear voice on this issue and someone who has stayed apolitical, but really uh, has been sounding the alarm on this facility for some time. So Ernie, thank you so much for being here this morning. Mahalo for having me. Let's talk about where we are right now in the process. I know that uh, you are not, your agency is not responsible for the cleanup, but there is cleanup going on from where you sit right now. How is that going? Uh, it's really hard to tell because uh, we haven't seen any of the data in terms of the effectiveness of the cleanup of the, their drinking water source at Red Hill Shaft. Uh, that's something we asked for, you know, like uh, the concentrations of fuel in the water before it goes into the carbon treatment system, and then what it, what it is like uh, coming out of the carbon treatment system. Uh, uh, we know as, only as much as I think the public knows about the uh, test results or what's happening with the flushing and uh, health department uh, lifting the advisories on different zones. Uh, and uh, apparently they've done that only on, I think, zone I-1 at this time. What about the testing uh, that is being done on the aquifer as well as in other areas? Because we know when this whole issue happened, there was a lot of question over the impact to you know other aquifers, to other areas within the island that might be affected. Uh, is that testing continuing to go on? And what can you tell us about the testing that's being done here locally? Uh, apparently, the uh, Navy uh, uh, is financing uh, equipment and uh, supplies and materials uh, for the University of Hawaii to start to do on some on-island testing. Uh, I'm not really involved. I'm really sorry, Ryan. I can't really uh, explain how they're progressing. Uh, but the, I, I think one of the things that's important is if we're going to establish an on-island uh, testing capability, uh, like a laboratory here with the University of Hawaii, or even the Department of Health, uh, for it to be, uh, in my mind, credible and reliable that we can rely upon to determine if the water is safe or not to drink, it needs to be EPA certified. Uh, and they need to go through that EPA certification process, which could take a year to two years. Sorry, wow. just to follow up, uh, you know, the question one more, maybe uh, is, is the Board of Water Supply doing any testing uh, of its own uh, on we, any of the other aquifers? I'm sorry, Ryan. <laughs> no, 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 no problem. I should have listened to your question. No, no, no. no problem. Uh, yes, we are. We continue to do testing of five wells uh, that are closest to the uh, Red Hill fuel facility. And we've been doing that for eight years. And the test results uh, from February 1st, I just saw some of the test results come back. It takes about one to two weeks to get it. Uh, it does go to a mainland lab. No detections of petroleum uh, contaminants in the in those wells. We just still have three wells that are still shut down as a precaution: a lava shaft, uh, air wells, and halava wells. What's the timeline for getting those three back open? Is there any time frame that you're looking at, or are these shut down basically indefinitely? Uh, for for now, I think the shutdown is uh, kind of indefinite. Uh, it really depends on the investigation that needs to get done uh, in the aquifer, especially the aquifer uh, from the Red Hill facility in and around the Red Hill facility, all the way across Halava Valley to our wells. Uh, we need to find out what's happening, uh, the nature and extent of contaminants, petroleum contaminants that may, might be moving with the groundwater across the valley. Uh, we still believe, uh, based on field test data, that there is a natural flow direction across Halava Valley. So if we continue, we start pumping Halavo shaft, for example, 
our concerns that we may uh, inadvertently uh, pump contaminated uh, uh, water into our drinking water system and experience the same issues the Navy is still doing, dealing with three months later. And that's what we want to avoid. Do you foresee any changes to residents here on Oahu uh, in, in regulating their water usage moving forward? Uh, we know right now that it seems to be okay, but I, I believe the last time you were on this program, you mentioned that during the summer months, of course, uh, water demand usually goes up and, and there may be some need for some calls for rationing of water there. What is your outlook uh, based on what you know right now and if we're in the same situation that we are in during those times where water is uh, needed a little bit more than normal? Uh, right now, and I, I looked at some numbers uh, about a week ago, I think the Honolulu water demand was around 58 million gallons a day. So we had to produce 58 million gallons uh, from our wells to supply the Honolulu's water use, uh, water needs. Uh, and that's from uh, the Halava area all the way out to Hawaii Kai, to uh, Kalama Valley. Uh, we think we, we may run into problems when that demand in the summer may climb closer to like 74 million gallons a day. Uh, and that's when it's gonna really stress our capability to keep up again, to balance, uh, making sure we have enough supply to meet the demand. Uh, so. We are, I've always kind of been saying this from uh, many weeks now uh, to kind of prepare our customers that during the summer months, especially, we're gonna need them to conserve water uh, and not waste it. And maybe need to even reduce their water so that the uh, demand for water in the Honolulu water system is able to be met with the supply that we have uh, still available. How do you actually get people to do that? It's one thing to suggest that the public do that. It's, and it's, uh, Initially, uh, Yanji, it's going to be voluntary. Uh, and we've seen in the past that, you know, uh, especially our, our customers and our people in Hawaii, they're very, um, they're very family oriented and they're very committed to help trying to work together as a community. Uh, so we've seen that uh, in the past requests for voluntary conservation, especially if we have like a major main break that affects a, uh, a large part of the water system that our customers uh, have been able to cut back on their usage. Uh, if we're unable to achieve enough savings, uh, then we'll look at measures that might uh, mandate or require uh, people to restrict different types of water usage. You know, for example, maybe um, no watering uh, of your yards on uh, certain days of the week or, and absolutely no watering between certain hours of the day uh, when their evaporation rates are the highest. Uh, maybe no car washes might be an example. So we'll go from voluntary and hope that we can, that all of us working together, pulling together, we can actually uh, get through the summer peak demands. Uh, if we can't, then you know we'll have to take uh, mandatory restrictions on water usage. Uh, we hope never to go there, but that's uh, that remains a, uh, an option for us. If this halava aquifer remains, uh, you know, indefinite, you know, the, the closure remains indefinite and there really doesn't seem, um, it, it may not be safe to tap that resource anymore. Has there been discussion to potentially look for another alternative source, uh, another uh, aquifer per perhaps? Uh, yes, you know, we uh, just had a dis uh, meeting with some of the Water Commission staff to kind of share uh, our plans to uh, look for uh, different alternative well sites to start drilling exploratory wells. Uh, so developing a new water source is a multi-year process. It starts off first basically picking a site uh, and then drilling a well that goes all the way into the aquifer below and then running a pumping test to determine the quantity uh, and also the quality of the water in the ground. Uh, if it looks viable, then we move into design and construction of a uh, permanent well station, uh, and then we have to build it. Uh, so we've got multiple exploratory well sites that are right now tentative uh, that we're looking at uh, to expedite the, uh, the drilling of the, of the exploratory well. Given the amount of water that's in the, 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 three, the three wells that we had, uh, and then now we don't have access to, are you confident that, they're all, they're, that there are alternate sites that can meet the needs that we had met before with these three wells? You know, one of the things I, I wanna make it very clear, a lava shaft 
uh, was a 10 to 12 mg million gallon a day water source from there. It's going to be very difficult to find a single location that can produce as much water from one facility. Uh, so what we're looking at having to do is drill multiple smaller wells at different locations uh, to make up that capacity of halava shaft. So the inability for, uh, for us to pump halava shaft right now is a major impact on our, our water supply uh, for urban Honolulu. Uh, so we're going to end up drilling probably multiple smaller wells. Uh, we're looking at sites that are where we already have facilities like a water tank site. Uh, might be at a higher elevation. And all of these sites, one of the main things of consideration is can the fuel leaks from Red Hill uh, fuel tanks get to that site and be pumped up into the well? Because we don't want to drill in a location where we could inadvertently pull up fuel contaminated groundwater. Uh, so we're going to have to go further west and probably more Mauka uphill to stay far enough away. Uh, from the fuels, uh, underground plumes that might Im be emitted from um, uh, the Red Hill fuel facility. So this really is a, the important point, and I know there's a lot of confusion because there's a lot of people talking about this, a lot of information coming out. Uh, and this is, this is the nature and challenges of this, uh, of naval, uh, this Navy Red Hill fuel facility and the groundwater issues. Um, it's very complicated. It's pretty, it's got a lot of moving pieces, a lot of different players. Uh, but one thing is Im important and clear, I just want to make sure that people understand it. From my perspective, it's vitally important that this fuel facility be emptied out as soon as possible, as soon as safely possible, and that no longer uh, can that large amount of fuel or fuel uh, be stored uh, just 100 feet above the aquifer there. So they have to permanently shut down this Red Hill facility. If they keep it in operation longer, then the risk of further contamination and even larger contamination of our groundwater resources, our precious vi, is real and it will occur uh, in the future. Uh, you I, know, sorry. No, just, no. We thank you for uh, sharing all this information. You know, one of the... Um, comments that you had made last time that we spoke was, uh, you know, just in the reworking relationship that you have with the Navy and that, uh, you know, often in the past, what they said was starkly different from what they were actually doing and the actions that they were taking. Uh, and there have been some challenges that have been noted uh, in multiple public capacities and, and, and publications of their ability to work with the state and in sometimes challenging the state. In your own interactions with the Navy, have things gotten better? Uh, and if you can share, you know, any insights into that relationship overall and their willingness to work with you as well as other partners involved. Uh, you know, I don't have a problem. I think they're willing to talk to us uh, uh, and they're very polite and professional when they do speak with us. Uh, I think the problem I have is the follow through. Uh, when we request information, we don't really get it readily. And when we get it, it may be a little difficult to interpret or it may be partial information. So I have to keep on uh, asking for it. Uh, as an example, I just want to say that, you know, uh, back in mid-December when I was there in the Red Hill facility, looking at the damages that occurred last May, uh, I made a request to the uh, uh, two admirals that were in that tour also uh, to please let the uh, report, the investigative report that Admiral Paparo uh, ordered uh, that was supposedly completed in the middle of G uh, January of this year. Please get that, give that report to us unredacted. Release that report to us unredacted. Uh, and I'll just say, uh, as an example, we still haven't seen that report. Um, and you know that I uh, I woke up at two o'clock in the morning thinking about Red Hill, which is not a good thing. Uh, but one of the things that just like a light bulb went on in my head uh, when I was looking up at the uh, the section of pipe uh, that was missing because it blew out with the pressure surges that occurred May 6th of last year. And I thought, well, you know, based on the tank level drop in tank 20, that, you know, that's probably closer to 19 to 20,000 gallons of fuel. But, you know, Board of Water Supply, we're very familiar with main breaks. And to isolate a main break and keep water from gushing out of the ground and flooding homes and stuff, uh, we have to close two valves. 
well, on both sides of that pipe. So on both sides of that broken pipe, uh, two valves had to be closed to isolate and keep fuel from gushing out of that break. Uh, so what was missing, I think, in, in my thoughts, and I, this is only speculation on my part, uh, the volume of fuel that came out of the pipeline uh, that leads up from Pearl Harbor all the way up to uh, Tank 20, which is at the very top of the Red Hill facility, which valve did they shut down, had to shut to close the other side of that pipe, the break on the pipe, and how much volume was in that pipe because the pipe was pressurized. And the water, uh, fuel would have been gushing also out of the pipeline itself, out of the 16-inch steel pipe. So did the Navy account for that volume of fuel in their estimate uh, of what the uh, leak might have been? And that's why I really look forward to the investigative report by, that was ordered by Admiral Paparo. And just to clarify, the Navy has been working with the assumption, or at least the public statement, that we're talking about 14,000 gallons of fuel but what you're saying is that it could actually be much larger. I think potentially that. I, I don't have uh, the information on uh, how much fuel also came out of the 16-inch pipeline uh, from where the valve is to shut it off uh, to the location of the break. And that might be a few hundred feet or more of uh, fuel. Uh, so that fuel in the pipe has volume. And uh, how many gallons of fuel was there that was also spilled out onto the floor of the lower tunnel? Uh, and, and that is in addition to what came out of tank 20 and tank 18. And just for clarification, and you've done a fantastic job in explaining this, but for some like me, who I'm a more <laughs> visual learner, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking it's almost like when you turn on a faucet that has a water hose connected to it. And even though you turn that faucet off, there is still some residue within the water hose that you often will spray out to make sure that the entire hose empties out even after you turn off that valve. Is that what you're liking it to, that there still might it, be some residue that's left in that Ryan, pipe? Ryan, that's a perfect analogy. Uh, your garden hose will still have water in it, even after you shut off the uh, the faucet, the tap, and that water will continue to flow out the end of the hose. So picture that hose being the 16-inch diameter steel pipe carrying the JP5 fuel. So how long the hose is the question, uh, uh, to where the tap is or, you know, the faucet or the, in this case, the butterfly valve that controls flow on these uh, pipelines that lead to and from Pearl Harbor uh, and how much water, uh, fuel came out of that, uh, that section of the pipeline. In addition to how much fuel came out of the tanks themselves. And then where did it go? Uh, how much, uh, how far down the lower access tunnel did it flow on the floor of the tunnel? which will tell us, you know, potentially how far uh, contaminants uh, could have uh, soaked into the concrete and rock and started to move downward toward the aquifer. So what do you think is, you know, given all of those questions, what do you think could be a more realistic number than the 14,000? Uh, I, I think uh, based on my discussions, you know, with the Navy personnel going in, in the lower access tunnel, I think the number is probably closer to 19 to 20,000. Uh, uh, the and how much and where did it go? Uh, did it all go into that drain line? Uh, so the Navy's estimate of uh, what leaked out of that drain line and got close to their drinking water source uh, on the lower access tunnel above their drinking water source. Uh, uh, that's uh, that's their number. Uh, so I, Yunji, I don't know the answer. Uh, I think we need to really insist on Admiral Paparo's uh, report that he ordered that that re be released. And I hope that would shed light on maybe the true size of the release. We saw uh, just a few weeks ago, there was a press conference that was held by the congressional delegation uh, led by the efforts of uh, Congressman Kai Kahele, as well as Ed Case. Uh, you know, and for the first time, it was a, a very inspiring a rally to see so many people there who were standing up for this cause and, and really calling for the end uh, of these fuel tankers. And in a lot of ways, it brought two sides of the community together that are often at odds with each other. Uh, many of the in the native Hawaiian community also being very active in this, um, you know, in this mission and, and really just trying to have this facility shut down. Uh, I'm wondering if you can uh, talk a little bit about uh, that effort, you know, that that rally that was held. And what do you think some of the benefits that came out of that um, in, in unifying the community in that way? 
I, I just want to say that uh, uh, I'd never been to a rally on a Red Hill Hill issue uh, before. That was my first one. Uh, that press conference that the congressman arranged, uh, but it really, uh, really touched my heart uh, to see so many, so many people come up to me and say thank you. Uh, that they were also concerned about the and and willing uh, concerned about protecting the water and willing to stand up and make their voice heard. And and so many from our native Hawaiian uh, community, uh, Kanaka Maoli, I felt embarrassed and also very honored, but you know, just very encouraging that the community was coming together like the way it is. And I think uh, uh, that press conference, that rally was an indication of uh, how our, united our community is. The mayor was there, also a lot of our state legislators, our congressional, uh, some of our congressional delegation, uh, Congressman Case Kaihele, we're all there and it showed, I think, unity uh, because that I think it's vitally important that we stay together as a community at all levels uh, on this issue, that we be of the same mind. Uh, the emptying out the field facility and the shutdown uh, permanently and relocation of that field storage, not over our aquifer. Uh, and we kind of keep that as our focus. Uh, I know there's still some differences uh, at, at the higher levels uh, about their position uh, on this uh, fuel facility. And I know there's reliance on the uh, state emergency order. Uh, but one thing we've got to remember is uh, uh, the state emergency order is being challenged by the federal government, uh, by the Department of Justice on behalf of the Navy. They're challenging it in state and federal court. Uh, so if they're successful uh, in amending or um, voiding the emergency order, uh, then, then we kind of go back to uh, my point that I've made at some of the community meetings. Uh, this Red Hill facility is a federal facility. Uh, it's, it's subject to the orders and mandates uh, from the president and from Congress. Uh, so we have to remember that our congressional delegation uh, being together uh, on the on their position on this facility is vitally important for our community because if at the state level, and we're gonna be there alongside with the State Department of Health, uh, trying to fight the fight to say that the order is valid and that the Navy needs to comply. Uh, but if we're unsuccessful, then it's really gonna be at the federal level in Congress or with the president that action needs to be taken to order the Department of Defense to permanently uh, do you feel and shut down the Red Hill facility? I want to ask you about that cleanup effort. As we said at the top, we know that you're not in charge of it. Uh, but how do we know, let's say it is the 14,000, that's obviously the conservative estimate by everything that we just discussed. How do we know how much of that has been captured and has been cleaned up and how much of it is going into the aquifer in those plumes that you talked about? When you were on before, you said you thought the migration across the valley could take about six months. How, how do we know how much fuel is, is traveling potentially through that space and, and how much has actually been reclaimed? So that kind of goes back to the, to the beginning, I think, of this discussion as the uh, uh, going back to the investigative report that will at least hopefully tell, shed some light on the volume that was released. And then where did it go? Uh, in what locations of the aquifer did it uh, get uh, percolate down and contaminate the aquifer? How much was dumped close to uh, the Navy's drinking water source? And where is it migrating? We, uh, Yunji, we really don't know. Uh, and this uncertainty uh, is... Uh, is uh, very frustrating uh, because we need the Navy and our regulators to basically order the Navy to proceed with the investigation uh, without delay, uh, to drill additional monitor wells, test wells in Halava Valley, uh, to do the groundwater flow modeling work to, uh, to try to ascertain the nature and extent of the contamination. We don't know where it is right now uh, and how much of it is, and in what direction it's flowing. Uh, 
we know that from Navy records, there's almost 200 gallons of historical releases over its almost 80 year history. So where did that go to? Uh, and how does the recent event of last year, could it have uh, caused uh, the fuel that was released earlier to start to become more mobile and start to move underground in the aquifer or in the unsaturated zone between the top of the water table of the aquifer and the bottom of the lower access tunnel, which is about 100 feet of unsaturated rock. Uh, was some of the fuel stuck in that like a sponge? And is it now starting to become more mobile and start to move? So there's a lot, there's more unknowns. So I wish I could give you an answer. Uh, you know, the uh, last time also that you were on, on the show that you had, you'd spoken of the number of requ requests for testing that were coming in from residents, the volume that you were receiving, especially when this first broke out and people were saying that their water may be contaminated in different parts of the island and that you folks were kind of going all, all around to just uh, test right. to really check that out. Is that continuing on? Are you still getting those types of calls, those volumes? And uh, have you found really anything else? It's really died down. Uh, we haven't found any, uh, and I want to be clear, we haven't found field contamination in the border water supply system, which is separate from the Navy system, which is contaminated. Uh, so the calls uh, really dropped off uh, uh, about requests uh, for testing or you know, investigation into their water. Uh, so it's really died down. Okay. Uh, we are almost out of time, but I want to give you an opportunity to tell people how they can be involved to help support your efforts. There's a lot of people who are very you know, complimentary of you and have a lot of wonderful things to say about all the work that you do. Um, but for those who want to support the work that you're doing and, and have their voices heard, what's the best way to do that? Uh, you know, stay informed uh, about this. You know, we have had uh, many meetings uh, with different groups uh, that they request, and we're open to doing that uh, to educate the community about this issue. Uh, also, you know, make sure that they are, are clear in their uh, support for a uh, position, especially if it's, uh, we believe it should be defueling and permanent shutdown of the facility and relocation of that storage elsewhere. Um, uh, to please let your elected officials know uh, and, and support their efforts uh, to actually accomplish that. This is a marathon, you know, like I've been saying for a while now, not a sprint. The, it will not uh, get resolved, I, I don't think, quickly, unfortunately. Uh, so we need to stay on top of it and keep the pressure on uh, on, on the federal government to do the right thing to protect our water resources that we depend on. Depend on. Well, Ernie Law, we thank you for running this marathon for some time now. You've been a, a champion of this and, and it's only the alarm for you know many years, we know, and we appreciate you taking time this morning to come on and update us uh, on the efforts that are happening and, and what you're doing over there at the Board of Water Supply. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. You're welcome. My hair used to be blacker eight years ago. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate well, all so that much. you do. Thank you so much. Great to hear from him. And Ryan, that, you know, 2 a.m. wake up call that he had for himself, that sort of night and, uh, you know, moment in the darkness that he was talking about and suddenly thinking about the water that was, or not water, the fuel that was potentially left in those pipes. Where did it go? How much are we talking about? Uh, that is very concerning. It's the first that we've heard of that, that the size of the spill could potentially be significantly larger than the 14,000 gallon number that we've been working with all this time. Yeah, and a lot of that it relates to um, still a lot of unanswered questions. And you heard that they are still waiting for that report that they requested uh, from the military that was done uh, and was supposed to be supposedly completed in January. Uh, and the Board of Water Supply had asked to see, you know, uh, that report uh, to see what they have found through that investigation. And that is one of the things that is leading to some of these other additional questions uh, without full knowledge and access to some of these areas. Uh, a lot of it will have to rely on the response uh, of the military and how they are able to respond to the, the requests, the requests uh, and somewhat demands from public officials as well as those officials like Ernie Lau at the Board of Water Supply. Uh, you also heard of his outlook for what water uh, usage could look like moving forward into later parts of this year. 
Yeah, that's right. We're talking about the summer months uh, coming up that the water usage, of course, increase when the weather gets hotter. And he's saying that we could be going through likely voluntary request, uh, at least to start to sort of conserve water, but then perhaps looking at more severe measures of limiting water usage for watering lawns or car washes and whatnot. And, and you know, of course, it escalates from there. So that's something that could affect us in real time. Also um, troubling to hear, honestly, about the efforts to find a new water source if those three wells that are shut down right now, uh, he says they're shut down indefinitely and that there is no single water source that they've identified up until now that can make up the halava shaft. Uh, so that we're talking about doing multiple wells uh, in different areas and that they're looking into drilling those. But he laid out that timeline. And of course, these are engineering marvels to be able to draw water from that deep in the ground and then get it to your faucet. Uh, that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of money, a lot of new infrastructure. So, uh, you know, we are going to be talking about this for some time. Yeah, and we know that this remains uh, an issue that many are passionate about and many in the community, of course, are concerned about. And we've heard different, uh, you know, members of political offices speak about out about this. Uh, again, Senator Hirono making some comments uh, yesterday as well, uh, as well as we continue to hear from our congressional delegation and uh, from the EGA administration as well. And so there are a lot of voices that are involved in this process and Ernie Lau saying, that one of the most important things is to make sure that everyone is on the same page and that everybody is uh, involved in this process because of the number of players that are involved at different and various levels of uh, from local, state, and federal government officials. Uh, but him, call, you know, he continues to call for a united effort on all all fronts to really solve this problem. Yeah, and on the other side, just as a full disclosure, we have invited the Navy to appear on this program. Uh, we we say that. You know, anytime they want to come on, they are welcome here. We're currently discussing that. We do hope that they will join us sometime in the next few weeks because we would love to speak to them about their efforts, particularly those cleanup efforts. I thought, Ryan, it was really interesting that he said that they're not sharing those results right now. Um, and that seems something that would be not controversial. You would want to be able to show here's the water that's going in and this is the level of contamination. And once it goes through the filter, here's what's coming out and here's what we're actually putting out into water sources right now. Uh, it seems like that information should be out there and disappointing to hear uh, that it's not. Yeah, so we'll continue to keep you posted. And uh, we look forward to speaking to Ernie Lau again uh, for another update in a, in a few months to get a pulse on what's happening there. Uh, on Friday, we are switching gears and shining the spotlight uh, on our police department here on the island of Oahu. Yeah, show poll making headlines a few weeks back saying that there's really a lack of officers, that the force is stretched too thin, uh, that we don't have the patrol officers that we need. Of course, we know that we have an interim chief right now. The police commission is looking for a permanent chief. We want to know about how that search is going and what they're really looking for. The police commission recently conducted a survey. They're going to be sharing the results of those surveys, uh, that survey. So we've invited Shannon Olivado, who is the chair of the police commission, along with Doug Chin. Uh, he will be joining us as well. He's a uh, Honolulu police commissioner, of course, a familiar face uh, to politics here in Hawaii. So Doug Chin and Shannon Olivado from the police commission will be joining us here 1030 on Friday. We'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs and Beachside Roofing.